Hey everybody, welcome back to yet another episode of Animation Dissection. You guys know the drill, I am Nixie here of course with the one and only Zorak. I mean, there's, there's technically another one, he is a cartoon character, but we don't talk about him here. It's not in the end anyway. Well no, because if, if you two shall meet, or refer to each other too closely, matter and antimatter and all that. I mean, it just makes things confusing. I mean, if we start having to talk about characters that I made the poor decision of naming my internet identity after when I was 12 years old, <laughs> we're, we're, going to, we're going to end up with some trouble. Well, it's your fault for keeping it. I mean, hey, after, one, after some point, it get, I was too far along to change it, so what are you going to do? Yeah, it sticks to you. So, yeah. um, before we get into talking about today's topic, which is Jim and the Holograms, Let's do a quick recap of the news. Um, so I think I'll just do a couple of really short things real quick. Um, there is a pretty good manga going on right now called My Hero Academia. Um, he was like a, an artist of, that I've really followed for a long time. His comic is finally successful. Um, it's getting an animated series by Bones. So I know a lot of people are really excited about that. Uh, and then Indivisible was able to get its funding. Uh, even to at least one of its uh, stretch goals to get more music, but not quite enough to get the uh, animated intro that they were proposing. Well, keep in mind that they're doing the whole post-funding as well, so people who continue to contribute after a certain point will actually still contribute towards those additional stretch goals. So there's actually pretty good odds of them actually meeting that goal regardless because people are going to continue putting money into it. Yep, so that's exciting. Uh, and then uh, some people had... Uh, messaged me about this one, kind of wondering why I wasn't commenting on it. Um, it's uh, Samurai Jack is getting a reboot on Adult Swim. And that one's difficult for me to comment on because it, it's kind of a, a beloved institution by a lot of people, uh, Samurai Jack is. And apart from just kind of like a teaser image, I don't know in what form it's coming. And it's also going to be Adult Swim. Don't know what the budget's going to be, what it's going to be like visually. And the reason I have difficulty talking about it is I was never really a fan of Samurai Jack. I mean, I understood what it was going for, but I think, um, especially because when I was a child and I watched it, I found it very boring. And this is someone who, you know, and, and I have a pretty good uh, threshold for uh, slow and, and other things that other people find fairly boring. I just found Samurai Jack to not really be that much different other than it was just a bit more quiet at times than most other action shows were the big issue as with many things tied to jenny tartakovsky is that they have major issues with doing narrative mm -hmm. they come from an era of you know of cartoons in america where doing a overlying narrative and having it go somewhere was kind of foreign you did episodic shows predominantly and that's where he came from and Samurai Jack was episodic to a supreme fault because it managed to have very minimal stakes by how nothing ever progressed. And in fact, they actually had episodes that called attention to the fact that the plot would not progress anytime soon. Yeah. And that's kind of just a mind boggling. Well, it's I a big fuck you to the audience in a lot of ways. It's like, oh, you know, you're just going to watch the same thing where he almost does it and then nope, every I mean, I time. I mean, I appreciate a lot of, like, the sort of stylistically it was very interesting, and I appreciated some, like, the episode direction on a personal level, because Jen D. Tartakovsky is a, you know, he's a, he's a very good director. Yes. I, I ain't denying that by any means. Uh, but the overall pacing of the work kind of sapped sort of interest out of it. Uh, I think you know, I, I think uh, Bob Servo made the, the joke of uh, the, on Twitter, like, didn't they basically dump the reigning episode of that show up on Adult Swim at some point anyways? And it's like, actually, I think that basically did happen because they managed to kill a lot of interest in it over time just with the pacing because nothing really happened. And as an episodic show, it didn't have a great pacing for it. Well, and the thing was, is it set a goal from the start. You know, like a lot, a lot of episodic shows, they're, they're able to be episodic because there's no end goal stated at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You can do like, they, or it's, if it is a goal, it's like a very like vague one. So let's say like things like G.I. Joe, for example. Yes, they're supposed to be kind of like there to eliminate, uh, what's it called, a Cobra. 
but that's such like a vague goal in a certain way and it's not um it's not as specific so you're not waiting for this exact thing to happen and you never got them to be like really close to it and then not like it seemed to tease at the idea of having progression because he had some recurring characters and it almost seemed like there was possible development but then not really so like it it kind of put on the airs of having a, a narrative without actually doing it so it felt like i was being lied to I mean, I, uh, the comparison I'd make with, uh, like, say, Samurai Jack is a good comparison is look at Case Closed. Or, you know, oh, Detective Conan, yeah, that thing is never going <laughs> to. Where that's a very episodic show or, you know, manga, actually. It's been going on for, like, two decades now, and they've been trailing along the same top-level plot line that hasn't moved in, like, 18 years. Yeah. Moved a little bit of beginning on, and then it became very episodic and detective, you know, just detective mysteries and that's yeah he might as well did just be an actual kid now for all intents yeah. and purposes yeah, like I mean, it's it might just as well about they that. should have just dropped that initial premise and just make him a super smart kid exactly i mean that's basically as far as that worked yeah and you know the the issue i have with jack is that, you know also is that the stakes were so low you know just by them wanting to make a grimmer show for kids made ever like okay everybody's a robot yeah like, okay. the, the violence like i saw that thing fucking eating okay two shots before it was eating food you don't tell me that's a goddamn robot no we've got oil <laughs> plowing out of it and it's like okay i appreciate that you're willing to push the el- edges there jendy but like at the same time you're also in order to remove the stakes from it to make it you know, be palatable for kids, for parents, you're also removing the stakes. You, you're doing it to get there for, you know, demographic reasons, but you're also getting there by doing the, the very thing you're doing to do so is removing a lot of that, you know, causes there to be emotional investment. Well, it's a compromise Killing... that satisfies no one. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Um. So, yeah, that's... Yep. Meh. That, I mean, that's, sure, that, that, it could be good. Maybe they'll maybe they'll have plot happen in it because Adult Swim does that occasionally. Or may, well, maybe the reason they're doing it is just because people want it to wrap up. They're kind of like, I want it to end. It's kind of like how a lot of people were really upset about how the uh, the first Teen Titans animated series ended on a cliffhanger. You know, I think in general, I don't know if this project is going to be the same as it was before. I mean, again, that's why it's really hard for me to comment on it as a new thing because. I haven't seen anything about talking about what it's going to be like. I haven't seen any indicators of what the visual styles. I mean, it's it's a lot. It's just a general idea. For all it. we know, it'll be animated in Flash, and it'll look really shitty. Yeah, as far as we know. Well, it's also Adult Swim budget, probably not going to be very high. I mean, Adult Swim's budget wavers wildly depending on the work and depending on you know who's in charge and depending on decisions. Because like, I mean. Keep in mind, like, Adult Swim at one point funded more Big O. Yeah. They they funded an entire second season of an anime at one point. You know, yeah. that's not very cheap. You know, and they do a lot of stuff. Like, you know, they funded part of Space Dandy. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, the, you know, and they've, they've done some higher element, you know, or higher uh, fidelity shows at times. And, you know. They have their own game studios and stuff now, for God's sake, so... Well, it's not so much that I don't think they have the capacity to, it's it's whether or not they, they choose to. Sure, and that's often, the big question. And oftentimes, the calculation is, who is the lowest bidder right now? And that's what yeah. they'll usually go to. Unless it happens to be, like, a, a passion project, I think, they will often defer to, as, as I think most business people would, and, and makes sense, is lo- lowest bidder. Sure. So we'll see. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the, so the reason I hadn't really commented on it right when the news came out is because I have no idea. And also, it's it's one of those series that I have a difficulty um, talking about because I have a completely different opinion than everybody else does, or at least a lot of people do. So, you know, it, it's it's kind of hard because I, you know, what are those things? They had the Scotsman with the bagpipe machine gun for a leg. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That was a thing. And so, uh, yep, so we have some other news going on. Uh, so one thing that we did that came up kind of in late October, and uh, we were on a little bit of a hiatus because this thing kept coming up. Yeah, this it happens. Yeah. Uh, an interesting bit of uh, news that came out of Japan in the anime scene uh, is that a voice actress uh, for this, who's been around for a while named Ai Takabe uh, was arrested for cocaine charges. 
and I, I wouldn't normally bring this up because kind of like a who cares type thing, but the thing is, in Japan, that's actually a very big deal. Uh, they've basically disappeared the person as a result, where anything that that person voice acted from has been taken down. Like, stop from me, like, official streaming, you know, any sites that mention her are gone. Uh, Japan takes drug charges very seriously, and they, you're basically dead as a person. Like, her, like all of the people carrying her from, you know, uh, from uh, a representation standpoint, like, dropped her and that sort of thing. Just some really crazy stuff that is really interesting. Uh, yeah, well, what, what, you know what would have been worse? Hmm. What, what if she, she had a boyfriend or possibly had sex? I mean, that's the only way it could have gotten worse for her. I mean, that, for, that's more of an idle thing, to be fair. Like, she's okay. just a voice actress, I mean, which is not true. strictly the same thing. Like, drug charges is just in general. Oh, yeah. No, incredible. I mean, in general, Japan is very um, war on drugsy in a lot of ways. Well, even, like, even to a more extreme degree, like, in the United States. Because oh, yeah. The United States is more kind of like a, we go after, like, a production side. Predominantly, you know. Well, you know, and and we and, we do and, yes, of and course, dealers and everyday people if they happen to, you know. I mean, well, yes, but there there is also some degree of leniency often, not always. Well, yeah, well, we have we don't compare. Have, I'm just saying, compared to Japan, where they oh, don't just well, yeah. throw a the book at everybody for even like minor possession, they will yeah. like basically jail them for years. And like, if you are a person, say for example, foreign who's in Japan and gets caught with drug charges, you will not be able to return to Japan. You will be, you know, kicked out. Banned for You're life. Gone forever. Yeah, yep. for life. You're fired. Uh, the, You're fired from Japan. And it, an interesting thing is, like, some of the works that were affected by them basically saying that they're no longer to show these works or, you know, or even acknowledge the work. Because that's the thing is, like, a minor voice actress in a show caused a show to be being like, oh, I don't know what show you're talking about anymore, because they just tried to, that level of, oh, Re we That's the creepiest ourselves. revisionism. <laughs> it's so yeah, we need, we need to disassociate ourselves that much that quickly. Uh, one of the shows affected is uh, the 2011 anime uh, Wandering Sun, which was well-received, and a lot of people had a, some, a lot of very positive things to say about it as a uh, work talking about some more progressive issues that Japan doesn't always touch on, particularly with regards to uh, trans identity and that sort of thing, and gender identity in general. Yeah. Uh, and that's, a, that's one of the shows that's impacted by this, because she was a voice actress on that show. Jeez. So it's kind of a weird sort of thing. It's not really a huge, impactful news that's going to shake up a lot of things, but just, just something It's a sign about. of something. I mean, it's, it, you know, we're not covering it from, like, a tabloid perspective. It's more of a, it is kind of something important about uh, archiving media. I mean, like, looking at the medium of film and things like that and trying to preserve the types of works and all the effort and labor of the writers and animators that just disappears because of just this one thing. Well, I don't think, I don't think they're going to completely disassociate themselves with it forever or any means. They're just, Oh, true. Not, but I mean, they're not bringing the work doesn't exist in like in its entirety. They're more or less sense of they're making it difficult for you to currently get it. Well, yeah, but they will once, as soon as it becomes, you know, like kind of like, Oh, the, the, you know, uh, all things are clear and there's not a worry about the low back they'll then bring out. Cause, yeah, well, let's hope. I mean, because, like, yeah. some things have gotten kind of, like, fucked up for less. I mean, so. to be fair, though, in terms of archiving of media, like, ultimately, industry is not going to be the leader there. I mean, look at... No, games, you're right. Media, you know, who is leading the archiving of video games? Well, we can very overtly see that the people opposing the archi archiving of games media is... The, in the fact, developers the themselves. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because they are worried about their personal copyrights and whatnot. And the, ultimately, it comes down to people doing semi-licit to illicit works, you know, in order to preserve things. And that's been, that's been something, actually, for, you know, hundreds to thousands of years. You know, things tend to be preserved not because of necessary official record, but because someone shoved shit in an attic... And maybe shouldn't have, and then, then we discovered it later after, yeah. you know, there was a change in sort of the commercial situation. Well, and then there's also just entropy, like just film stock and, you know, all, all forms sure. of media, even digital, degrade over time. So it has yep. to be kind of upkept, and if you want to get a certain quality, a recording off of something, you know, de degradation overall. So it's just, I'm just saying, like, it might not happen in this case, but if in the future there are more kind of cases like this, it can kind of make that preservation uh, a bit more difficult. So, I mean, and, and also in general, I'm, I'm a, a big fan of making a media being access to a lot of people with, that, with as few barriers as possible. So this kind sure. of thing, I, I feel, is uh, at least fairly important. 
Um, another bit of news uh, from a weird standpoint is I believe Ruby is getting a localization in, in Japan and might yeah, be airing they, on TV. They're, um, they have a Japanese voice cast and everything. Um, here's the thing. Uh, I, I don't know if you've really scanned Crunchyroll lately, but you'll see a lot of really horribly made um, short programs <laughs> that are often done in CG. So mm. their appetite for bad CG, I don't think, is as high as it is here, at least for television, because holy crap. Um, yeah, I mean... <sighs> oh, boy. So I... I know people have been, like, trying to say, like, oh, it gets much better in the second season, you know, to, like, us, and it's kind of like, uh... I've got no interest in that. I'm sorry. I, I can't. Not, I, mean, I think it's on its third. First... It's on its third season now. I think. Um, yeah, you, even after the passing, um, the unfortunate passing of the original creator. Uh, but I, unfortunately, I just have to say, it's not anything I've got any interest in. It's the the core narrative and what they're selling here is still to me. Even if, if they say, "Oh, we increase the quality by a lot," it is the most. The idea is boring. It's the most basic sort of, you know, like it's it's the video game that they made into a cartoon, but there was no video game at first. That's basically it. Like yep. it's like kind of a video gamey ass plot. Like and it's kind of like well, eh, again, video. again, as I as I like to compare it, it's like Harry Potter and Naruto just got smashed together in a blender with yeah, blender. And, <laughs> and and the and the main advantage of the only good thing I really found about Naruto, why I stuck with it long and said, hey, the art style and that wasn't that bad. Nice uh, uh, well, uh, until until the studio just eventually stopped. Well, sorry, I wasn't watching shit. the anime for Naruto everywhere. Don't watch <laughs> the anime for Shonen series typically because that is a poor decision on your part. Well, certain ones they've actually been getting um a lot better now. So, like for example, Haikyuu being a Shonen sports series, but okay. being animated by Production IG. Sorry, now <laughs> let me let me re, let me re, reframe that. Shonen fighting series that are serialized over decades. Yes, that that it's much more specific and much more accurate. Because all of those ultimately solve issues because the pacing they always start the shows too early, and so the pace they get caught up and then they have to pad it and everything goes to hell. One Piece is utterly fucked right now. Like One Piece has been completely screwed over by the plot thing, in term or in terms of the pacing, because they got caught up way. They, they, they've managed to pull back a few times, and then they caught caught up in a portion where they couldn't shove filler. Oh, God. So the pacing went to, like, normally the pacing for this sort of thing would be, say, two, three chapters per episode. It was getting down to half a chapter per episode oh. during a major confrontation. Jeez. Like a major thing. So how like how much of event. the how much of the episode is previously on for like five minutes? Then that way you have like ten minutes uh, of actual content, and then the rest is like maybe this is coming up. The previously stuff was like four minutes long. The rest, <laughs> the thing is, otherwise it was just mostly just reaction still shots type stuff. Yeah, I mean the the thing is, is the anime version of that series is bad enough already. I mean, it was, it's fine animation quality, I think. It's just that the pacing went to fuck. And for a while there, it wasn't terrible. I'm going to... I'm very curious to see what it'll be like when they uh, Dragon Ball Kai that show. If like, they if do, they, I mean, it'd be nice if they did, because I, I mean, tried the show's so it. popular that I would presume it's going to happen eventually. You know, if not this decade, some other decade. It, it might be after, after it, like, finishes up or something. Sure, And sure then it it's been off the air enough to do the whole nostalgia thing. Sure. Yeah. Because One Piece is still insanely popular in Japan. So. Oh, yeah. So that's mostly the manga again, and the anime is mostly popular because of the manga. Yeah, the manga. well, and again, uh, it's in the same magazine as My Hero Academy, and that one's getting top ranks these days. So that's exciting. And then you also had, I think, uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy that did uh, Gege Ge no Kitaro. Yes, uh, Shigeru Mizuki unfortunately uh, passed away last week at the uh, ripe old age, at least, of 93. Yeah, I mean... Uh, <laughs> He he was doing comics like right after World War Two. I mean, the guy yeah, is sh he's a fucking incredible individual. Yeah, uh, I wholly suggest giving a look at some of his works. Uh, they've actually been released. The manga works of his have been started getting released in the United States through uh, Drawn and Quarterly. Yeah, uh, and and they, they, and they do good. Drawn and Quarterly has pretty good quality um, book versions of things. Like they're. They're pretty good, so that that's exciting. It's like the yeah. they're like the Criterion Collection with those types of comics. Sure, and, and like, like Mizuki is immensely important for a lot of reasons. 
uh, he did kind of com- he codify and sort of push a lot of the sort of yokai as a cultural phenomenon after the war. Like he made like a lot of the representations of yokai and monsters, and ghosts and such in Japan are based on the depictions that Mizuki did. And a lot of the characterization that came for later works comes from his works. And he's also, you know, very important as just a phenomenal individual in his approach to manga and like in uh, his own personal character. He, you know, he, he was born prior to the war. He fought in World War II, lost an arm. And he actually came back and was writing works fighting against Japanese revisionism of World War II. He definitely had a very anti-war perspective, but also a definitely a very anti a perspective that's against the you know the glorification of Imperial Japan during that period. He, it's and very um, anti-authoritarian. Sure, he, yeah. he's got a very he's he's very down to earth in terms of that sort of stuff, and he, he's been incredibly popular from a cultural standpoint in Japan for kind of pushing against certain attitudes that are very seductive in circles and sadly and, still going in some in some cases sure. and, and you know and his passing is going to you know hurt that to some degree as is you know the passing of anyone who lived during that period uh if you're curious on looking at some of his works i the work out of his i'd suggest as a first look is uh his semi autobiographical work uh nononba uh him talking about a, his uh, grandmother who taught him about goats and stuff it's got a bit of the biographical stuff and it's also got you know the yokai stuff depending on your taste of which of that aspects of that work you like there's a lot of biographical stuff that he has of his time during the war for example but there's also a bunch of stuff like kitaro itself which is you know kind of more a, a children's adventure type thing involving you know yokai and such and nononba is a good sort of kind of look at you know his works like that uh, he also did a biography of hitler that i hear is actually pretty decent yeah well i mean someone has to do it <laughs> why not why not the guy that's actually very anti-authoritarian um some other things that happen uh this is not actually a recent thing at all but it's a thing that noticed and it's actually mildly re- relevant to talking about uh, shigeru mizuki uh someone translated apparently back in may some people discovered this actually like a couple months ago uh and it got a bunch of attention as these things sometimes happen I, and did a blog post translating a, a discussion between naoki uh, urasawa and uh, hisashi Gucci talking about manga in the 70s and 80s. Uh, all, both of these, you know, mangaka have had a bunch of anime made by them. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting because there's a lot of them talking about sort of uh, philosophy in terms of adoption of creative influences and such. They talk a lot about Otomo and they're sort of influenced by some, you know, French artists of the period that really influenced them style-wise. Um, and they also, you know, they talk about Shigeru Mizuki, for example, and like how, like, a lot of the writers and mangaka of the 60s, you know, died at the age of 60 because they were working, you know, sleeping three hours per day and doing 400 pages a week, bragging about it. And then, you know, the, the joke is that, you know, they kept on bragging about it and Shigeru Mizuki never really understood that because, you know, he slept nine hours a day and, you know, felt pretty good about it. And look, and he basically joke because the joke that Mizuki made is like, oh, look at me. Everybody else is dead. Yeah, well, well to ninety three. Other, it's otherwise known as uh, karoshi, which is death from overwork. Exactly, and that's you know a major issue with you know a lot of you know, stuff tied to animation and you know comic making and whatnot. We go pretty, oh boy, you know, somewhere. Oh but, god, you know. yeah. I mean, look what happened to Satoshi Kon. I mean, he his his uh, condition was actually relatively treatable if they had done something early on. So I, I think we'll put the uh, the interview or this discussion in the show notes just because I think it's a really phenomenal and interesting read, even if you have no yep. familiarity with the uh, artists involved or even what they're talking about. There's a lot of important just sort of discussion about it as a creative person doing sort of work. There's also a lot of interesting stylistic discussion going on there in terms of yeah. art styles. And, and the, uh, the name of the, the, the blog it was on is called the Manga Brog. Yeah. We'll, we'll put it in the show notes as well. Of course. Uh, and one little interesting thing in there, uh, I just completely just blanked on where I was going with that. But never mind. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, uh, I will, will point out that Naoki Urasawa, one of the authors that's in this interview, is one of my favorite manga like creators of all time. So check out their work sometime if you get a chance. They make some good shit. Good to know. Yep. So um, I think that's about it in terms of news. Uh, well, there, there is one thing that's unrelated. One semi-related. more thing. <laughs> one more thing. Uh, we're going to this week to be talking about Jem. She, oh, she, yes. Dude. So the she's astounding. The reason we, we, we picked this, yes. Yes, the reason why we picked Jem <laughs> was because they were making a uh, film 
adapting it to try to take advantage of the sort of cultural weight that is Jem. Turns out Jem has jack shit of cultural weight, and also the, the movie was bad. Uh, they had the movie in theaters for approximately two, two weeks, weeks, I believe. Yes, it, it made something like uh, four or five million dollars. Did it really? Like, Th- that, that the, but that's like that's shit for what I that mean. Was. Well, sure, but I was all, well I was for how surprised. many? Th- well, it depends. Okay, so like if if you are releasing a movie on let's say you know fifty screens or something like that, or versus a, a film being put on like three hundred screens. A lot of the the important data is not the the number at the end. It's how much over time and over how many screens. Because also, I just it takes. Up. They actually made only three million in the box office. Okay, so and I, their budget I was, was five million. Yeah. Okay, so I was close. <laughs> oh, I think you may have had the numbers flipped slightly, but there, yeah. it was doing so bad that they took it out of theaters. Yeah, I mean the it's thing was is that this. I think it it didn't attra- It's it's again as I said earlier, it's a compromise that that pleases nobody so it was a very standard bland premise that you've seen in almost every type of film of like a, a the music drama kind of thing before wait are you talking about the film or are you talking about oh the the, the film i mean we're, we're oh, gonna get I mean, what are you talking about i, I mean I think oh it's hard it's you know, hard to tell it's a bland very, show that's very generic and well they're they're bland in different times. ways in the sense that it didn't have the weirdness and the dumbness in the same way that the original show has, like if it kind of embraced the the horrible eighties ness, it might have actually kind of been a, a a fitting homage. But by doing this kind of really almost completely unrelated story, character, style from the series, the fans that it was supposed to attract were not going to show up. Like pretty much when you saw the trailer go up, everyone's like, "This looks like shit." So it wasn't. You know, by ignoring, they spent the money probably to buy the rights to the name, and they could have just released this film as its own film and not call it Gem of the Holograms, and probably would have done the same level of success. But they spent extra money buying this dumb name <laughs> that had no cultural capital to what they were doing. So it was a bad idea. I mean, well, let, let's get into the show then. So, Gem it was the a Holog- bad idea. Yeah, it was a bad idea all around. <laughs> so, well, here's the thing. So. It was made in, uh, well, at least it, it ran from 1984 through 1988. So it ran for three seasons. Um, and for a couple of them, it actually was a very high rated show, but it's also the 80s. So that's not a really high bar to clear just because of the television landscape. Not necessarily, See, in a, not necessarily, in a, it's not an endorsement of quality. It's that it was on the television and it was one of the shows that, wasn't aggressively just for boys so it was a little yeah. bit you know like that, maybe there was nothing else going on at the point at the point yeah so that's what i mean so like it's not an endorsement of quality it's just that it happened to be highly rated which is why it had a certain degree of cultural capital and why people kind of remember it well they might remember it for other reasons but we'll get to that so it was produced by uh marvel and sunbow productions but a lot of the animation itself was done by toei not necessarily their a team <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was done by them, uh, and it was created by uh, a woman named Christy Marks. And what she had done before is that she was a writer for G.I. Joe and Transformers. Mm. And you can kind of see that <laughs> in, sure. in how the, 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 the plots for certain episodes or like the premise for the episodes are kind of weird. And a lot of the, the this happened, and then this happened, and then this, it, you know, this weird cause time, and effect though, that makes no sense thing. But at the same time, though, we'll just say, because I'm going to be very harsh on this, you know, those shows, while they were also not great, they had more going on oh, than this yes. show. And I've got no affection for those. Like, I'm not coming out of the sense of, like, like, nostalgia. I have no nostalgia for those shows. I was born after those shows. Yeah. I got nothing for them at all other than looking back at them going, like, yeah, I like robots. Sure. Yeah, I mean, this no. this show originally started before I was born. The first time I yeah. had ever seen it was on television in a random local station in the middle of like Merced, California, in the in like the early '90s. Like that was that was my only exposure to it. And I think it was a spinoff called The Misfits in Hawaii. I it was that's how little I had been exposed to this as a kid. But then Wait, I kept they on made a, hearing they made about a spinoff show. It. I, I don't know if it was a spinoff show or something, but it was like The Misfits in Hawaii or something. I. Again, this was like early 90s. I was right. a kid. I barely right. remember this thing. So 
here, but here, okay, let me get my compliments out of the way because there's, I, I mean, I'm I'm agreeing with Zorak here. It, it's 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 horrible, but credit where credit is due. Some of the episode backgrounds look really good for that era of uh, of programming. And then, of course, there are some other times where the backgrounds are, like, really poorly done and coffee tables are four feet tall or in the wrong perspective. But I kind of found out why um, the, the parts that were good that were good is that a artist named Glenn Vilpu, who people in the animation community or in art training will recognize as being, like, a really very talented artist who does a lot of teaching and, and he, he knows his shit. Um, so it's pretty sure that the layouts and some of the boarding that looks good is mostly him whereas everything else is is i mean as as we see with toei's animation these days yeah at the same time though i have to applaud at times where they're doing some very ambitious things visually but there's no way that at the talent level and the budget they had they could pull them off without it looking like garbage so like some of the weird transitions or or the the abstract kind of things going on in the like musical numbers, like it could have been an interesting thing if pulled off, but there was no way, no way they could actually do it. So instead, it just has a bunch of very stilted. Um, it's animated on what I would call fours. So for those of you who do don't understand the terminology, I'll do a really quick thing. So. Typical animation is done at 24 frames per second. So that means you're doing one draw, uh, one drawing per frame, meaning 24 drawings for one second. You don't always have to do one drawing per frame. Um, that's often suicide. Um, only like Disney films really did that. Uh, a lot of people will be able to animate what's uncalled twos, which means that instead of 24 drawings, you divide that by half and do 12 drawings per second. So you're taking one drawing and you're shooting two frames on the same drawing. That's actually still pretty fluid. Well, you can continually divide it further and further and further. And it's, of course, easier if you can do things that are, you know, makes uh, easy divisible by 20 in 24. So you can do threes and you can do fours. I, I swear this thing was like animated on fours or less <laughs> because like there's no amount of smoothness to any transition um, the in-betweening is really bad. A lot of the time, the characters are... They're posed, and they react as if they're like a Barbie doll being, like, positioned. Like, they have that level of expressibility. Mm. At least that's what it felt like to me. Like, the animation sure. was very stiff. Like, and, and the way they moved and reacted yeah. and they're posing, it felt like I was looking at a plastic doll half the time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it. The, the the general fidelity of the show was extremely low from an animation standpoint. The art style in general, and I think the aesthetics, you know, they are ambitious, very of the time. Yeah. But I like the style in general, like the sort of hair metal, sort of punkish. The intro sort of is probably punk. the best thing about the show. Sure, I mean it's not like great, um, and it promises a lot of things that it can't cash. But some of the aesthetics and the transitions and like the it, the ambition it had, it's just that there. With those types of character designs, you'd have to have like a decent amount of budget to keep them consistent. You have to have a certain level of technical ability in your animation team in order to pull that off. I mean, we found that a lot with Hanna Barbera's things, where you had an artist like uh, Alex Toth doing these amazing designs, or uh, the guy that designed uh, why can't I remember his name? He designed all the Scooby Doo cast. Um, he was such a good draftsman in his designs, but none of the animation team was really able to draw as well as him so the animation itself had to end up being very stiff and practically just traced back versions of things and and stuff like that so i think that was the big problem with this is that the characters in the way they're drawn at least when they're optimally drawn requires a lot of effort in order to do it let alone have it move well within that limitation yep. i mean the musical number bits uh weren't were more interesting i'd say than the sometimes rest of the show no yeah <laughs> They weren't some totally of them. Some of them were very, very poorly animated. And a lot of really bad reuse. Um, some of the songs are just this. They just repeat the si the the title of the song over and sure. over again. <laughs> well, sure. I'm not saying that they are super great by any means, but compared to the general quality of the show, they were often better. 
So that says more about the quality of the show. And to be fair, I'm not saying that the show was terribly animated. It was just oh, it's not good. Dull. It's, it's not. It's, it's not well animated. I, I, the word the the term I would use for it is very banal. Yeah, that that that's a good way of putting it. I think. Um, so we watched uh, four episodes. I did a little bit more research, and I put myself through a bit more of the intro, which actually last. I mean, I only assigned the first episode of the intro. The intro itself, and I don't know why, it takes them five episodes to do the premise of this goddamn series. And there's no characterization at all for any of these people. It, t- it still takes them five episodes episodes to do it that's the most astounding thing about that first episode is that you have all these characters and not a one of them has any personality (laughs) exactly (laughs) exactly it takes five episodes and you don't care about anybody still you learn nothing about their motivations or anything it's just astounding and like there's so many i guess what i would say is just missed opportunities that you could i mean like they 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 spent so much and so many random details into this thing and and all these high concept shit coming together that they just kind of go well this is a thing bye like oh you have like a a supercomputer that could possibly change the world wow how did my dad build this uh just i'll just use it for you know dazzling lights and music and make myself look sl- and put i'll have it holographically put a wig on my head what, like, why do you need to have a secret identity at all? It's, it's never addressed. It's never explained why she has to. It, it, it's just her with a wig on. The and show there's is... this amazing technology that would change the world that her dad must have spent millions of dollars. Just millions of dollars. A record company executive's millions of dollars. Apparently, I guess, a record executive uh, who only owns half of his own company. Only owns half of his own company, and yet when his daughter gets that half of the company, she can make no decisions about it. Because apparently owning half the company doesn't actually mean anything. Well, I'm guessing there's also no other shareholders. That this company is literally... Two people, 50, yeah. Like, 50-50 owned. But and- the thing is, like, if you own... Ha- okay, the whole p- pitch of the show is that her, her, her father dies... She we inherits never see. Half. We actually never see him. We never see and, him. And we never oh, also, understand the relationship. No, okay. Nothing. Okay. Can we pause real quick? Yes. So I was just reading. I, I paused there when you were asking me a question there, and I paused my later. I was reading the Wikipedia page for Gem, and I was looking at the character page, and I only just discovered that the one character, other character of the in her band, is her biological sister. I did not get what? that at all. From really. Any of the other, I did not get that at all from any of the ones we watched. That so well, I was paused there, quiet, because I was just really deeply thinking, like, what, was that ever indicated at all that like no. they were they were at this orphanage that the father owned, and it turns out like the one is her biological sister, and the other two were adopted by the father. And I was like, I don't remember that being indicated at all. That he, well, the thing he is, is the those, ho- those hologram characters might as well not exist. For as no. much as like they they have no personalities individually other than like I think well I, I'll get into it when I get to one of the episodes where I go hmm that's a little racist um other than that they're they're they they're less than a Greek chorus they're basically just there to say things when having Jem repeat the line or or react to something would just not work that was entire that's entirely their purpose is just to be a second person in a con- uh, a third person in a conversation. That is literally it. Cuz otherwise mean, maybe, it's all gem. Maybe they get a lot of characterization in the other seasons. Who knows? Who knows? Well, we we but, jumped but, but, we I made sure to jump around okay. the, se- the season. So the, these episodes that we watched are from the beginning, middle and near the end. Nothing. Not th- then there's chances they have opportunities to do so. You like you could imagine a better show would have like the relationship between the characters or have like the weird problems that they overcome. Maybe it's that one character's chance to shine, or it's like you have an arc based or at least an arc of an episode or something like that, or conflict based off of one of the members having a problem. No, like they're just there. Like there's, there's, and also like the fact that they're a band and any of the struggles that a band would normally have to deal with just don't really exist for them. Certainly. So, okay, 
let's let's real quick describe the concept of this because I think this is really important. Yeah. Here for some no, of the, no, no, the premise. Make, um, I mean, why I it makes yeah. no sense. So the whole thing is that her father dies. She inherits half the company. Her her father's business partner gets the other half. And uh, Eric because, Raymond, who who has you know who who thank God his devi- his uh, character design comes uh, with devil horned hair. The, the, with the, with all the subtlety of that. Yeah. So the whole thing is that because her father's partner owns half the company, he's able to make all the decisions about how the company is run. Because... And she can't. And she can't afford to buy a refrigerator. For her orphanage, which is why this entire thing starts off. Okay, first of all, okay. this whole th- this whole thing is that okay, we we don't our company is for making profit. He says it's not here for running a charity. Well, first she runs owns half the company. She actually has equivalent decision power and how that company is run. And also, one. charities work as tax breaks. So yes, for two. She owns 50% of the company. She gets shared portions of all the profit. And the revenue. You, yes. She you gets own dividends. What you own. What exactly. Is going? Are they going just to her, like, goddamn hair and makeup? I mean, where? Like, yeah, that's exactly. why I was so – Or what about, like, in the inheritance of her dad's estate beyond that? Like, yes, they go, well, I inherited half of Starlight Productions and Starlight House. Clearly, she must have inherited more than that, considering the man had enough wealth to build a super fucking computer. Yeah. And also, this was the 80s, and record companies were still doing well. Like, they still existed. <laughs> and apparently, as we discover later, they also were in the business of producing records. So, like, okay, let's go with this. Um, So, Jim inherits her dad's company and her dad's orphanage, doesn't seem to notice or care for a while that the, you know, devil-horned-haired Mr. Raymond has completely upended the business and that her income has changed at all. Like, she comes in and goes like, oh, what happened here? Like, it's all weird. Like, how long has it been since your dad died? Like, have you just never stepped in or asked a single question? Like, did you just not notice, like, when the check stopped coming in? And so she she goes up to find out what's going on, and, you know, Eric is a, a huge douchebag to her, and, and they find out that... The main antagonist of the series arrived because Eric has decided he's going to put all his eggs in this one fucking band called the Misfits, who ride in on guitar-shaped motorcycles. <laughs> oh, up onto the top floor, so they're riding the t- that up in they're elevators. They're in the office. They are riding in there and, and doing wheelies and like donuts, and it's like what? And it's like he apparently had the money to buy this, and it's like and so Jem hates them pretty much on site and just antagonizes them right away even before finding out they're shitty people and so they decide smartly to threaten jim who owns half the company that owns them by riding around in circles on their dumb motorcycles and start the first of what is going to be many terrible fucking music videos and so in so they decide to do this huge bet of like uh well if if uh the misfits win this battle of the bands competition you know, well, well. To be fair, they don't make the bet at that point. It's just like, oh, oh we're going to do a battle of the bands. You can't do anything. Get out of here. I hope you don't discover a holographic computer that'll allow you to make a band and upseat my band. So, it's so, basically- it, well, here's the thing: is like, apparently, local battle of the bands competitions are more than just events run by community centers, let alone one that they have fixed to help the misfits win over like the usual high school kid participants. Also, if, like your band is, <laughs> if your band is so bad that you need to fix a battle of the bands and have them be better than generic-ass area bands, you have major problems with selling that band to anyone because who the fuck's going to buy a record of them? And they're also like this really weird visual K kind of thing, which I, I mean, I guess it was popular at the time, but I didn't know it was that popular of a phenomenon. They like metal. But they're not really. They're not really. No. And so, Jerrica's uh, orphanage is fucking falling apart, and on a dark and stormy night, she receives a gift of some really tacky earrings. And then- Wait, uh, wait, wait. Can we real quick pause for a second there? Yes. What fucking kind of name is Jerrica? I don't know. None of the none of the names. They're all '80s names, okay? Like they're it's, like, everything the about the '80s was a horrible mistake. Like Jerrica? Like is that like it, like they were gonna write Jessica, but then they like started stuttering them well, all. Well, it's Jerrica called Jem, so we'll just use the first two letters, so that way no one gets confused. So why did you do like Jessica then? <laughs> like like he thought, I, he I, thought I, he was I, gonna get a boy, so he's like, oh, I'm gonna name him Jerry. Jerrica, fine. We'll just make it a girl name now. <laughs> 
God, I have to imagine that in school, people just kept going like, how you doing there, Jer? Like, hey, Jer, can you pass me a milk carton? Jer? <laughs> God, fucking Jer. <laughs> the fuck? I bet there's an episode about that. I don't care, though. <laughs> You're not going to watch on. anymore. So, no. so she receives these tacky earrings, and so then uh, Fi, the holographic robot from Link's Sword, appears and <laughs> tells them, uh, what was the name of it? It's Synergy. Its actual name is Synergy. <laughs> Yeah, of such, course. Synergy is such an 80s thing, too. It's a business team type of, oh, God, just everything about this is 80s. So I wish the, I wish the computer console had those 80s shoulders on it. Like I really wish it did. It, it looks like a, a really bad version of, like, a stand from JoJo. <laughs> God, it does. So, <laughs> Here's my stand, Synergy, with it I can make music-based holograms. Holy shit, that basically is a stand. What the it fuck? Really is. It's your stand. <laughs> so, so this character leads them to an abandoned drive-in movie theater, yeah. otherwise known as Platform 9 and 3 quarters, and it, because it urges them to literally drive through a wall. And the, the best thing is, is it's like, She's like, hey, like, we should drive into that wall with it. And we're like, we're not going to do that. Jericho's like, well, I have a hunch. Well, I guess if you have a hunch, we'll just drive straight to this wall at full fucking speed. I mean, thank God it's a hologram, but still. So. <laughs> they could just ease in. They could have just, like, back, tested it out. They back in. They could have just gotten out of the car and walked, like, instead of driving into it. I mean, just just to show the the decision making abilities of Jim. So we learned that this thing's called synergy. It again, world breaking technology, but only really put to the use of making people look even more fucked up in eighties than to anything useful. I mean, he probably could have made a fortune off of synergy. She could probably do something to make all the money off of synergy than like the music industry, which was you know heading towards collapse. I mean, imagine the telecommunication abilities of being able to project holograms from a computer anywhere in the world to earrings yeah just think about that crazy. revolutionize the entire communication system of the world now i'm just going to use it to make, make my hair sparkly i mean there's a whole lot of that sort of stuff let's keep in mind in another one of the episodes we watch what's the bad guy's name in i almost i almost eric said vermin Green. eric Green. i almost said i almost said vermin is scum who's the rat man from cat and planet he might as well be. Uh, he might as well be. Uh, so his, at one point in an episode we watched, he teams up with a hacker to hack time and send Jem back in time so that they can't compete against them in a band competition. Yeah. that They couldn't sell their time travel technology to the government? Well, like, what kind of world is this? Like, we don't really see advanced technology anywhere else other than in these random locations or, or the guy fucking to... hacks it's... time itself <laughs> yeah, no. I'm hacking time whatever <laughs> fuck it uh, you're pay... what are you paying me 200 bucks okay <laughs> so fuck? and here's the thing so so the gifts don't really end with just this amazing computer her dad also left her the clearance rack at dress barn <laughs> which is the entire uh... costuming for this fucking thing and, also, and, conveniently and, and enough, crazy... a bunch of guitars and, and drums oh, no, and, and stuff. And, and don't forget the Roadster, this oh, yeah. awful-looking car from the 30s. Yeah, sure, yeah, congratulations on your shitty car. Why don't you pawn that so you can get your fucking refrigerator? Well, no, no, least... they, they make the orphans save up money to buy yeah, a make... refrigerator. Why did you sell your fucking like, rich-ass car and get like a minivan? That seems to be a lot more useful for your orphan friends. All your orphan friends are having to eat warm meat and like, like powdered milk because you can't get the new fridge. So they, the so, so they have all this stuff, and they're like, "Well, what are we gonna do? What the fuck? You should just give it this computer and everything you could possibly use in the world." And they're like, "I know how we could solve this. Let's enter the battle in the bands tomorrow. This band." Jim and the Holograms is formed in literally less than a night. And they give no indication that they have any musical, musical talent in any whatsoever. time before this. So, uh, also, I just I just thought of one thing that I need to say now before we move any forward. What the fuck is with Jerrica's hair? I don't know. It looks like Her hair looks like she fucking, like, got, got set whacker. on fire. 
<laughs> yeah, like what the fuck? Is that a style? No, oh, it's just like a burn. It's Something like someone afflicted. set Meg Ryan's head on fire and put it out halfway through. Yeah, it's like, what the fuck? I mean, it's mostly in this episode that it's like like that, but it's like, what the fuck? Uh, yeah, it, is... it's it's just so bad. Um, and so they go to the Battle of the Bands the next day, which just looks like it's held in a local park with like sparsely attended. Like there's maybe 25 people watching. <laughs> this is really important for our media empire guys this is the only way we're going to make a breakout this hit for you is, misfits yeah, the, 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 as we show like, these two dozen people who you are we're we're starlight records we couldn't possibly have a marketing arm beyond the local community center and we had to make sure we fixed it unless these 20 people were encouraged to re root for the wrong band but don't worry we still have the money to buy how you rock guitar-shaped motorcycles and build supercomputers. So this is when they do the really dumb bet, which is exactly how businesses work, I guess. I mean, it's a totally fair deal. And since I guess there are no other shareholders in this shit company, it's okay. I mean, like, and then, and then a movie executive comes to this local battle. I'll make a movie! Movie of this, of this bet, and not just that. I'm gonna write you a blank check film deal, just you know that we're scouting out local battle the bands for, and then they'll also be given a magnificent mansion because that is what <laughs> movie studios yes. do. I movie will studios pay you. do this for music artists. <laughs> Yeah, I love what? the idea no. that that like that, that, he that is how the of it. He just literally holds up this big placard photo. It's like, no, no winners will get this magnificent mansion. I love the idea that the, everybody in the movie industry is simply paid in mansions. Like, oh, like all the major winners get multiple mansions per film. It's just. <laughs> and so then immediately, immediately after this bet is made in front of God and everybody the misfits decide oh that trust stealing, me god is not watching this <laughs> decide, god has better things to they, do they decide that stealing their instruments is gonna stop gem in the yeah, like they do that right in front of like all these cops and people watching the misfits steal their guitars and it leads to this really dumb chase sequence well and again here's the thing gem and company have already been marveling at the fact that they have enough equipment to start a dozen bands anyway and yeah. yet they're like they're stealing our shit after them and the thing is it's like again like, why no would you chase that or just call the fucking cops? No, and this is like grand theft and then eventually attempted murder. Yep. No one is called. They even go like, oh, it's like they even mention, well, thank goodness they never called the police or filed charges against you. And it's like, why? Why didn't they? <laughs> there is no reason not to. So they're they're in a car chase two seconds later. So like it's they're shown in a downtown area, like in the middle of a park. Two seconds later, they're already on, like, the cliffs of a coastline, getting their shit, like, thrown back at them in the back of Misfit's van. And this almost causes Jem and her friends to fly off a cliff. So, again, attempt to murder to the list of charges that are just never filed. What, okay, and there's an awful I have to stop, lot of like, that. What is, what is it with, like, all these cartoons in the 80s and 90s that just exist in lawless anarchist universes where there is no, like, justice system or policing or anything? So it wouldn't make their narratives work at all because they have this whole thing that they have to do with, like, we have to make them bad guys, but the only way we can make them bad guys is if they're actually breaking the law, technically, but we call attention to the law, there's actual consequences, so we just won't call attention to it. Well, it would, it would have to reel in the character's behavior to such a degree that they couldn't just come up with, like, a dart being thrown at the wall premise. Because sure, they'd be going like, that's that how, was... That's how society itself works, the reign in, like, sociopaths and stuff. Yeah. And this show requires absolute sociopathy to go completely unchecked as the basis for any and all conflict. So, and here's the other thing is the music video interludes are basically introduced with all the grace and subtlety of like a family guy cutaway. And the thing is, again, the songs are mostly just them repeating the name of the song over and over again. And some of these musical interludes are not like what's called extra diegetic. And they are literally breaking out into song in the situation at random moments in front of people. Because again, like, so sometimes in musicals, it's it's uh, kind of like a, a break from reality. So in within that reality, people are not actually, you know, stopping and doing choreographs. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's like a, it's like it's a, a, a representation. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a like metaphor a or a representation. No, like sometimes 
every once in a while they literally are breaking out in a song and yeah, then people go exactly. oh yeah if you keep singing like that it'll be great it's like what the fuck they're what what <laughs> they just in the middle of nothing like and and sometimes they just have there's no real cue for them to even go into the song they just start yep they just all know and so uh to, to make this even even more of a, a fix uh, Mr. Raymond hires someone to break into Jerrica's house, which will, I guess, do something? Like, I, I don't know what he was exactly trying to accomplish. And at the same time, one of the orphans tries to steal money from, like, the jar that the other orphans were having to raise money to buy the refrigerator for. Okay, okay, can we real quick pause, though? Why the fuck did this episode keep fucking going? Like, this episode felt like it kept going for fucking ever. It does! Well, again, because it has five episodes in order to cover this fucking premise. But they keep on adding all these different subplots, like, you should- For no reason! <laughs> you should have hard cut this shit, like, fucking, like, eight minutes ago before the chase. And it's like, oh, you keep on adding all this other shit in here. It's like, oh my god, guys. Like, you have a... Episodes have to have an internal pace, and you can't just keep having, like, rising and falling shit. Okay, so this, 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 that happens, and, and they're like, you have to give us $30! You know, to, to make up for it. And it's just... It doesn't really go anywhere other than, like, one moment um, that's in the episode after. Then let's get to the the boyfriend character, Rio, who is basically a non-character, and he's not really told about the holographic thing for, I don't know what reason? Like, it's never really given. I also want to point out that our first introduction of him made him really seem like kind of an asshole. Well, not, well, at first when he is at the funeral, but then the rest of the time you show him trying to fix up everything and almost electrocuting himself. Yeah. Um, and he's apparently their band manager, but he does not get to know about what Jem yeah. is. For and again, reason is never given. Like, what's the why? Why is she hiding her identity? Like, what's the point? Like, again and again, it's literally just a wig and makeup. Yeah, it's like what the fuck? Why, why even bother with like, that? Like, it's it's like they wanted to do like a cutie honey type of thing, but they just really couldn't come up with a reason for it. And so, uh, the break in causes uh the the uh. I guess wait, the holograms. That, even, wait, wait, even that doesn't make any sense though, because everybody knew who Cutie Honey was. She only did it for espionage. Oh well, either way, <laughs> I don't know. So, like, so this it, it, this episode ends with the house burning down. Um, yay! Yep. Um. And so, okay, I I watched the next episode just to go like, okay, I have to see like what the fuck <laughs> because it's going. To, it's still insane. It doesn't make any sense. They do another car chase, which is actually, if you want to see, I think, one of the worst animated car chases I have ever seen in my life, and we have covered Speed Racer. Hey, now, you take it back. Speed Racer's amazing! <laughs> in comparison to this one, it's, it is, it is like, Beethoven. I would watch some Speed Racer right now. It's um, bad, and I love it. And that one on. has another thing of, of of attempted murder and and a bunch of like decisions that make no sense. They do a a perf- uh, impromptu performance in the front yard of the Hollywood guy, just yeah. so that they could ask him, that so they could wake him up to ask him to let the orphan stay in the mansion until the contest. So they do a band performance in his front yard. They could have just waited till like the morning and go, hey, this happens. Could you like let them stay somewhere? No, we have to do that. And then, then why don't you sell your fucking car and get a hotel? Or 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 the technology, everything, just everything. Yeah. Like or or what about your dividend? All all those questions. Yep. There's even a point where um, Raymond hires the same guy who fucked up the break-in to plant a bomb in the mansion. No police are ever called. It's like ah, oh, these people are trying to compete against me for this company. I'm gonna blow up. These children. These and and multiple bad. times, the misfits just like, here, I'm going to do something. Shoves the person they're unhappy with, go to some vehicle or another, hit a button, and it goes out of control. Like, they do that three times in that one episode. It's it, like, that's their solution to every problem. You'll notice it, too. Like, they get pissed off, shove the person they're angry at into something, and then out of control vehicle. <laughs> so let's go to the next one, which is... <laughs> journey through time 
which is, it, okay, which sounds way more exciting than it actually is. No, it's, it's actually really horrible and dumb. But again, it's, but it's, I, it's really <laughs> dull is the, the funny thing. So the whole shtick is that apparently there's this returning villain here who is computer hacker man. And in order to have the misfits be able to succeed at something or another, he went ahead and hacked the, the holograms from like a million miles away into like the past. Okay, and so – I I I I'm glad I took notes because I I had to keep track. Is there of this more shit. to this? Yeah. So like, okay, there's the world history of music concerts. Oh God. That, with headliner right. Jim and the holograms. Oh boy. And so Mr. Raymond at I guess what he formed his own company called Misfit Music. Again, forming a company entirely around these three group these three people, and he's going, well, gee, why don't my group of criminals who have somehow never been arrested for vandalism, attempted murder, how come they don't get these kinds of gigs? And so he, like, the misfits come in. They're all like, I want to do that concert. You do something about this. Like, don't worry. I hired, like, this guy called Tech Rat, who's basically, and if you've seen other episodes, he's kind of like their handy evil Jimmy Neutron trope given flesh and has built them a device to help get this gig. This, this, This show that's about musicians and music. And this device is to shoot them back into time. And they don't explain, like, how that was supposed to do anything. It was just like, we're going to send them into the past. So that way, no, I guess no one else is available. Like that. They're just, they, they why not just hire someone to kill them? It's going to say like, like well, here's a thing. Here's a, no, a novel idea of something else you could shoot them with. How about a, a gun? gun? <laughs> it's, it might be crazy, but I think it might work. And so the first, and the first song in this episode is like rock and roll forever. And so Jen uses her holographic powers to make everybody dressed like the stereotypes of various countries. So you get like, and you get someone wearing a kilt and a bagpipe as a representation for the UK. So the Scots will be really happy to know that they represent all of the United Kingdom. I mean, what else were they going to do? Like, is, is and again, turn into this whole thing like is Ringo? about, yeah. And again, this whole thing is to celebrate rock and roll. And so the countries they involve are Jamaica, Mexico, and Japan. I mean, Hey, the... I mean, I'm not saying that they don't have rock and roll there, but actually and... Jamaica is actually very, very important to rock and roll. Hmm. But Mexico and Japan, I mean, I know they have rock and roll there, but I don't think of them I, – I think of rock and roll as just being kind of a quintessentially, like, Americana type of thing. I mean – Either either way, it, it has, like, sombrero, and I'm like, oh, God. So um, Jemmy's not, Jem is not really happy with the song um, because somehow it doesn't encompass all of music history in one song. It's like, because that's fucking possible, to encompass all of human history into one song. And so – uh, they cut back to Tech Rat's, like, what his time travel machine actually looks like, and it looks like one of those computers you see in a dungeon from, like, Fallout 3, and it's fitting because his voice sounds like that of a ghoul from the same series. It's like, I'm Tech Rat, what are you guys doing? <laughs> and they're cunning, again, so their cunning plan is just to send them back there and abandon them there, and so they, they send them back to Vienna in 1781, and so here's where the weird, like, like drawback, I guess, to the time machine is, is that in exchange, people in the past have to be sent to the future um, at, it, it, to exchange the same body mass, okay? Well, one person arrives from Vienna. Isn't this just the plot of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, The Turtles in Time? Well, again, he just literally said equal body mass. Like, I, that's why we have to keep, you, you know, when you send someone to the past, someone from that past has to come here. Like, I think that is actually, again, the for a, mu- a music group and a magic computer equal one 18th century socialite in body mass. Look, <laughs> the knockers on they, that lady. They, they didn't have anorexia back then, I guess. I, and also, it's good to know that the language in Vienna is English. And, and so their first reaction is, we've been set back in time, but that's impossible, says member of a band with magic holographic technology. And their portrayal, so they meet Mozart, who is a very American sounding guy who just laughs at random moments like a complete imbecile. And he wonders where his like fiance has disappeared off to. And apparently Solieri was like a mobster. In 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 the past, because he's worried about his my evil rival Solieri's men is are going to kidnap me to make sure I don't make it to this concert. <laughs> just, just <laughs> here's the best part. So like they they do the whole like oh we're we're gonna holograph 
uh, someone to look like him. And so when we get captured, you know, he'll be able to, it's like through diversion, make it there. And so Mozart arrives. And then we see in the background, Solieri is being carried off, carried off with guards carrying axes. We never see him again. <laughs> Very clearly, he's, he's not going to be surviving that night. And so a lightning storm um, fucks up synergy uh, at the same time. And so the gems uh, suddenly look like their normal clothing. And all these people in Vienna shout, Witches! Sorcery! As they are chased out of the concert and almost stoned to death. And so then in the present, they're like, you have to send this person back. This is getting annoying. And so they send her back, but then get two American soldiers from London during the bombings in World War II, which I guess that sends Jem there. As I, I don't know. No. And so they then do the whole thing as, okay, so we did Mozart. Now we're going to just jump and skip everything else in between and go to 1944 <laughs> with the Ben Tiller Orchestra. And there's more period clothing that just looks really horrible. And it's like, you know, you guys shouldn't be outside with all the buzz bombs dropping anyway, as like sirens are literally blaring and buildings are on fucking fire. They're just having this great conversation on the street about like a female band. <laughs> That's the silliest thing I've ever heard. And so then they decide to perform together on stage. And it's actually the song they do here is probably one of the better ones they do because it's not low rent eighties music. Right. So then they're, they're interrupted by an air raid siren in which a airplane then crashes into the music hall Of course. An airplane because they didn't know how to draw a bomb. It just looks like a fighter jet just like flew right in after the commercial break. The group then gets transported again before being crushed to death by like falling debris this time exchanging the soldiers for some hippies. And so here's the thing. Does that mean that the soldiers just got switched in their place and are now going to get killed by dropping debris because Jem was there? Did Did so. Jem and the holograms just murder soldiers? Accidentally, I think so, yes. <laughs> oh, God. And so they do a whole bunch of hippie jokes because, you know, whoa, far out, man. This is going to be a bad trip. <laughs> Drugs. Kids cartoon. And yeah. So, and this is when the misfits do their their normal great decision making process and insult Tech Rat, and he just goes, you know what, fuck you, and just sends them to 1969 as well. And so it's time for Woodstock, and I, you know I was really hoping that we got to see all the orgies and drug use because, you know, why not? And they meet this guy. <laughs> His name is Johnny Beldrix. <laughs> They're not allowed to call him Jimi Hendrix. I guess he's like, I'm, I am for fucking hell. His, or his estate is like, we are not letting his name anywhere near this. So you're calling him Johnny Beldrix. Yeah, and then we also meet the uh, the past version of the record exec guy who is also wearing bell bottoms and everything. Well, no, they don't because they it's a different manager. I thought that was the same guy. Well, no, because that's the hologram they create. So, like, the, so Beldrix's okay, manager is going to make them play with the Misfits, I guess, because right. they just appeared out of nowhere. He's like, you're a band? I'm going to make you play with this guy. Um, and who? Uh, and the thing is, is, like, Johnny Beldrix also hates these people on site. Like, literally doesn't, before they even open their mouth, he's like, yeah, fuck these chicks. <laughs> hate them. And they're like, and the Misfits are happy because they're like, yeah, we get to play Woodstock, the greatest concert of all time. And so this is when Jem sabotages the Misfits performance by making a holographic version of Raymond. Ah, I see. So that way, it, to let the other producer know that they're already signed with him. So the guy's kind of like, you know, this is the most outrageous thing I've ever heard! You're fired! Because, like, he's, they, they lied to him, I guess. And so mm. the Misfits handle this like they do every issue. They shove someone into something and pull a lever. <laughs> Which causes the um, the the uh, synergy to fall from the ceiling, and right before it hits the ground, they all get transported back to the present in the nick of time. Um, I guess no one really learns anything. The misfits are pissed off um, and exchange uh, Eric Raymond with a dinosaur. Right. The machine then gets destroyed during that process, and instead of just abandoning him in the past, everything just goes back to normal. 
Oh, and then we get a song that just kind of rattles off some historical music figures, and that's it. And they stop at the 50s, and they don't actually mention Beldrix in the song either. They pretty much just went like, okay, we're going to go Mozart, uh, Tiller Band, and I guess we had this other guy, but he doesn't count because he's black. <laughs> it's like they, they, everyone else gets a shout out in the song. He does not. Uh, what is it with these cartoons and always doing like a time travel story like this? I mean, it's it's something quote unquote novel that they can do. It's a, it's just a checklist of of these premises. Sure. So, I mean, these shows that are episodic are all checklist as fuck. That's just all they are is just checklist, checklist, checklist. Yep. Well, speaking of, now it's time for intrigue at the Indy Five Hundred. And so, yeah, this, this, this one's even dumber. Somehow. Somehow this one's even dumber than the time travel episode. I have... I I can't... In, uh, I mean, I think the reason I'm so angry or so excited about the show is because it is so painful to watch. It is... It's painful in the most boring way. Like, the yeah, shit that's, that's the thing. That's the, the thing shit with that's the happening we, sounds I, funny, but it's not. It's not even funny in, in the weird sense. Like, you know... It's so dry. It's so utterly dry that there's stuff in here that should be interesting in theory, even from like a weird standpoint. Like, it, oh, in like, a speed in this... racer sense, it would be funny. Yeah, it, and like in this episode, pacings... like the misfits, the misfits ride their cars through the restaurant that a bunch of people are in and fuck shit up. That's bad. It's like that should be exciting and weird, I guess. But somehow it's not. Somehow it's not. they have devised it in their pacing and tone that just nothing. You feel nothing. You just feel nothing but rage at what. I mean, you're I don't watching. even. I don't even feel rage. I feel no. At, like, I mean, not at the show, but at the time you've wasted. I mean, I, I, I just feel always just the crippling, like the the thing I have to fight is the going slow, that the fat. slow tick down of the t of the clock as death approaches. Closer. Well, I have to, I have to fight for going for that fast forward button. Is what I got to do watching this show. It's kind of like, oh god. I took notes. I had to stop every once in a while to write what happened so I could remember what the fuck is going on. See, I, I gave up on writing notes after, like, th that second episode. That's that because I assumed you, d you were going to not do notes, so I, I did. I did notes on that first episode. That first episode, I had plenty of notes. That second episode, I was like, uh, oh, God. But by this point, I'm like, no, nope. I'm good. <laughs> okay, so... Indy 500. So the Misfits just hate their manager, like always, and they throw a bunch of darts and egg at his face um, because they're really upset that they don't get to go to a party for race car drivers. They also really, really want to play for, like, the Indy 500 victory parade or something. Like, that's apparently, like, the biggest gig in the fucking world. And this party that they're not able to go to is essentially just, like, a mobster meeting. Like, replete with, like, a huge bodyguard that threateningly, like, crushes people's hands. Because it is literally a mob meeting with fixing the games, pressuring sponsors to drop drivers, and, like, fraudulent betting. Also, I don't think this show understands how betting works, as we all get into. So, they, 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 they want to pressure this one specific driver to not participate in the race, so that way their car will win. Which is, again, the same exact premise of anything to do with the Misfits. Let's get rid of this competition so that we don't suck anymore, I guess, by comparison. But luckily, Jem and her record company step in to sponsor this driver that the mobs were targeting. Is that something that record companies just do all the time? Uh, I mean, I mean, cars are sponsored by weird things for these races sometimes, like Rolex. Sponsors but but to be but to be like the sole sponsor. No, probably not. So, and, and here, here's the best part of the episode, is that the first song title is I'm Coming From Behind. <laughs> Phrasing. <laughs> so, the Misfits' plan to get into the party is to literally crash a car into it. Yep, it's just literally just drive their car through the middle of it. Like, yeah, we're at the party now! Ah! Yeah, so then the sponsored car driver, like the one that Jem backs, saves the day by by just jumping into this 1930s vehicle on display that I guess luckily has like the keys and gas in it and careens his car at the one that the misfits had stolen. Again, nobody calls the police for any of this. And then the bodyguard literally dismantles the car with his bare hands. And before doing a time trial, no one really makes sure to just make sure like the wheels are attached. So like, this is like the next day and like, in order to fix this race even more, the bodyguard just literally pulls off the screws from an Indy 500 car with his hands. 
Yep. And and so so before the time trial starts, like did did no one just go like, here's our basic vehicle check before we put you on the road driving at three hundred miles an hour? Just I like mean, no one fair, ever do that. Who would we would go around to remove all the screws from a car? Well, that that's not the issue so much as just that's the the standard maintenance procedure before anything. Sure. Like I guess no one does. So it careens off into a a. I, it's like a, a watchtower of sorts and almost murders Rio. Um, Rio makes a, a joke about uh, in the hospital. He makes a joke about the premise of crash, not the racism one. It's the, uh, the sexy fetish one where he's like, well, if I want to get kisses, I guess I should get more car accidents. <laughs> uh, uh, it's a fetish. So uh, somehow synergy is then they're like, well, what are we going to do? I know let's fix the car ourselves and drive. <laughs> We're musicians! <laughs> so somehow Synergy is going to help them fix an Indy 500 car. Again, these are just musicians, and all they really needed is a holographic blueprint. I'm really also starting to think that Starlight Records has no other employees to handle anything. <laughs> so they're, like, they're like the mechanics and everything, even when they were prior to that, everything going wrong. Yeah, like, there, like there's no team, I guess. It's just the driver and the car and Starlight. That's why I was so confused when I was asking earlier, is this something like record companies do that they also manage the team that handles the cars? Like, no, a sponsor is just like, here's some money. Money for advertising. Yeah, like that's, that's it. literally it. Also, the car does ha has no advertising on it at all. Yeah. So there's no reason for any of this. And so, uh, God... So, so here's the thing is, like, they, they, they showed in the first episode, like, one of the characters is the one that typically drives the van, right? Like, mm -hmm. the one that's not Jem. It's like, this could have been a chance for her time. Nope. Nope, it's Jem. Jem is also an indie driver. Uh, so basically, here's the other thing. So, like, racing fans, I'm really sorry to say this, but it looks like anybody can do this without practice or training. It just, it boggles the mind. So, when Jem enters, uh... And they're like, oh, shit, he, this, this car is going to show up after all. And I guess I'm trying to figure out what the whole deal with Raymond and the mob is, is that he's supposed to bet their money on their own car. So he's yep. like an intermediary. So that way. And but in the end, it doesn't matter who wins as long as the bet makes the money back. So he won't get his you know legs broken and he won't be fitted for some cement shoes. So what he does is he goes, oh, shit, I'm in a TV show about Jim. She's in the race. I'm going to change my bet. So I don't think it understands how betting works, though, because once the event starts, bets stop, right? Yes, that was the thing that confused me is that he's like, yeah, can I, he goes up there and says, yeah, can I change my bet? And the guy's like, sure. Well, the only reason the guy would agree to do it is because every time he takes a bet, he gets a commission. So mm. Raymond keeps on losing more money every single time he changes his bets. Which is what they're going for, but at the but same But it still time, makes no like, sense because that's not no how sense. betting works. Yep. Like you, that that's like any everyone would just wait till the last second and put in a bet then. Yep. Like it, it, it just, I don't know. It's just nothing. So he he constantly through this episode just changes his bets as like things go from like one thing to the next. And so, um, the misfits see uh, uh, Jem driving. They're like, I hate Jem. And so they just run into the street, throw a driver out of his car. And just start driving. <laughs> nobody stops them. Nobody like no, arrests them afterwards. No, no, nobody. No, nothing. This race is still apparently entirely valid. <laughs> and so this cause, and so they, the pizzazz throws Jim off the road, which causes Raymond to go like, oh shit, I'm going to win after all. So he changes his bets again. Again, co again completely forgetting that he realized he was in this the show and his original change. The only way, again, it's just the... The commission thing is the only way they can try to explain away, like, why anyone would allow this to happen, and it still doesn't make any sense. Um, yep. Jem's car starts breaking down, and she's like, no, don't worry, I'm going to still drive in this broken, unsafe car with a wobbly wheel. And she goes like, you know what, how I'm going to win? I'm going to use Synergy to cheat. So she tries to fuck with Pizzazz by creating an illusion of her conscience. And and Pizzazz is like, hey, that won't work on me because I don't have a conscience. And it only works because it distracts her. Um, and she kind of like 
turns her wheel at the wrong time and shit like that. It's like, again, this is just, that's just cheating, though. Like, yeah, she's fighting other cheaters, but she's still cheating. Yeah. That's our protagonist, I guess. And so then Raymond um, changes his bet again back to Jem, but this time he doesn't get his ticket for the, the bet. Because every single time the guy has given him his ticket, it's been like in an empty hot dog bun or something. I don't know why. I guess that's supposed to be covert. But this time he accidentally got a hot dog instead of the, the betting ticket. So he, um, you know, I guess he loses in the end. Because, and her, her back tire literally breaks off and she still wins. And then the car flips like four times. And she gets saved by some people in the audience before it explodes. I'm like, again, no one comments on that at all, ever. Um, and then the very end, Eric Raymond is about to get murdered and maimed by the mob. Like, they're literally going, like, he's probably going to die. Like, again, children's cartoon. Only this gets interrupted by the misfits who, who try to dr run him over with a car. And then the mobsters are like, well, you know what? Uh, even worse than us killing him, being stuck with the misfits is a worse fate. I mean, they're not wrong. They're not wrong, but I mean, like, it's entirely a fate of his own choosing that he could easily just not do. He just, he, he put his entire company on the Misfits. It's literally, it's called Misfits Music. With the yeah. K at the end. So, uh. the last one is, it's, it's almost like a crossover with uh, Captain Planet and how, like, just... But it's so fucking dry and nothing it's, happens. It's even dumber. Oh. Well, no, it, it's worse because it, it, I don't even know. There's actually one good aspect of this, is that we we finally learn why Pizzazz is so fucked up. Her this dad character is like one of the worst parents I have seen in a while, because the shit he says to her is like devastating, like multiple times. Mm -hmm. Um. So Pizzazz's dad. So Pizzazz is one of the misfit characters. Uh, has a He's rich a businessman one. dad, and that ex kind of explains a lot. Um. And Eric Raymond had previously worked for this guy's movie studio and completely ruined it. They're like, hey, daddy, I have to introduce you to this guy, Eric Raymond. It's like, Eric Raymond, you destroyed my film, my film studio. It's like, and then he, so his response to that is, well, don't worry, it'll be different this time. I actually know what I'm doing. Records. You know, despite the rise of like cassette tapes in the 80s, Raymond thinks that the by opening up an oil refinery near the Alaskan pipeline, this will somehow make vinyl cheaper to print records. And he also seems to think that record companies are actually responsible for their own vinyl pressings. Which they're not. No. And so and and so he presents this idea, and the businessman is like, mm, I don't know, this doesn't seem right. He's like, anyone smart enough to invest like the in this could make a fortune. Hmm, a fortune, you say? But how many records are you selling that making cheaper says, records would actually says, make you money? He says nothing. He doesn't. He just says you you could make a fortune, and the guy's just convinced by that. So this is apparently how businesses make decisions. Just tell them it makes money. Don't question or like how or why or if it makes even any sense at all, and they'll just sign off on it. This is probably the closest thing this show has ever gotten to reality. <laughs> so possess. That possesses dad then just after this lays it on really thick that he wants his daughter to stop being like a huge fuck up and make him proud by not letting Raymond fuck up again. Again, he's like, make me proud for the first time, possess. <laughs> <It's> like, Jesus <laughs> Christ. So then it cuts back to Jem's orphanage and one of the orphans has like an Alaskan pen pal with like pet seals and, the, and their island is going to get bought to put the factory on. And so much of and this it's plot like, feels like a dial by numbers type thing again of like oh like the seals Alaskan seals pipeline. could never get re I mean even then like seals could never get relocated I mean also seals as pets like please don't I I mean I know people see seals on beaches and shit and they think they're like ocean dogs or something don't don't go up to them don't like hug these are wild fucking animals <laughs> like Ugh, it treats them like they're dogs and pets and things like that. It's like, no, do, do not do that. It's like, again, it's like a Captain Planet crossover where it seems like it almost has like a well-meaning environmentalist message, but then just completely fucks it up with just nonsense. And, and literally the way they explain is if the factory is built, they'll all die. Well, how? How is the factory going to do that? Are they at, or, or, oh shit. Or Zarek, are, are seals made out of vinyl? <laughs> I mean, 
I guess. Or, they never really were that clear about any of that sort of stuff, about how the factory was going to destroy everything. Yeah. Uh, it, it was kind of hand-wavy, like, oh, the, the entire island will become a refinery, and then what? I mean, I'm I'm not pro like factory or or refinery, but no one is making an argument about like what's happening with this with this right. at all. It it doesn't make again doesn't make any sense. And so the 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 gem of the holograms are luckily doing a concert in Alaska anyway. So well, they'll just coincidence. yeah, like what it's like Alaska really. <laughs> also, what time of year is it? They never really make it clear. It has to be summer. But right. but but there's snow everywhere. Yeah. Because their song is about midnight sun, right? Like, that was well, one of the lines. It's like, well, that's in summer. You know Alaska has seasons, right? Like, just like anywhere else in the world. Uh, it's just... Uh, and so, um, the... the uh, we then cut to, uh, what is it? Uh, the Misfits and Air- Air Raymond making their way to the island on sled dogs to set up a fucking factory. Do they, are, are they going to just no, deliver? No, they're, they're heading there to make the business deal with the, with the family in order to make the factory. But yeah, but, yeah. How, but how was there no other form of transport? Well, that, they, they make a joke about that. The well, they make a that, joke about that later, but at well, the no, beginning. No, they make a joke about that then. They're like, ah, oh, there was no other way to get out there. And then they see the, the, the holograms plane. And the misfits are like, ah, no other way, huh? You're just a cheapo. But but what I'm saying is, is how okay, so you're setting up factory there. How are you then gonna transport all that shit? Well, pipelines, clearly. The last no, 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 but they're 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 gonna print their records there. Oh yeah, yeah. So they have to ship it. Yeah. Because again, he's not saying we're gonna invest in this oil company that will then sell like no, we're gonna print our own records for cheap because we'll own the oil and supply. They okay, so they they do address that, but only like at the at near the end of the episode, where like, oh well, once we own the island, we can use like ships to come in. But like, well, then why didn't they just come in in a ship anyway? Like, how does that family there get any of their shit? They have electricity. Right. Like, there has to be an infrastructure or something. I guess. It, it. I mean, so much of the episode is complete nonsense. That it's nonsense, and it's also just so much inconsequential. Like, it has like this. Sort of uh, facility of like, like they're going with something that like there's almost like a Captain Planet esque thing that they're going with all this in terms of like messaging and like, like they're, they're just like they're trying to think deep about you know issues about representation and like oh you know like this is our ancestral land and you can't just let go of all the heritage and you but know, they don't also <laughs> the environment stuff but they it's like this is like the most barest like inclination that they're going to do it and then they just goes in completely opposite directions of oh the uh, i am changed the guy, the guy is ultimately not changed by like their arguments it's more like oh the the gems weren't assholes yeah well no That's the other it. thing is um the entire the entire thing is it's as you say like they could talk about the environment they could talk about like the ancestry they don't they literally just go but my seal my pet seal who's named Muku or something that's oh, it we'll that's it another, that's uh, literally seal elsewhere uh. yeah like that's like that's entirely the basis of the argument it's like like and and the and the brother who's like I want to get out of this fucking shithole because you know he's in Alaska and he's like I want to be able to get, send her to college with this money. Mm-hmm. No, I guess, I guess, I guess, in this case, letting her get whatever she wants, and 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 being able to, I guess, have a pet seal, which no one should or can really have, is a good, you know, trade. Yeah, like his argument is not wrong. No, he's not wrong. I mean, he's a bit of a dick at first, but he's not wrong. He's actually and not- and, and selling out his land it does have like a very potential negative outcome. But at That's, the same time, that, that argument is never posed to him, though. No, no. The entire reason is I want my seal. That's it. That's pretty much like it's it's like a temper tantrum in that form, like that, and that's apparently I guess emotional enough to try to sway the audience or something. I mean, again, it's there's plenty of good arguments you could have used otherwise, and it uses none of them. Yep. And then there's a whole bunch of really pointless chase scenes. What is with the chase scenes in this show? They're all pointless and they're all so dull. Well, let's see. These this one has them uh, being chased by an iceberg. <laughs> Yeah. Um, 
they they decide to go swim out in, like uh take a kayak out in the middle of the really high currents to go see this fucking seal that she keeps writing about <laughs> and they get stuck out there uh and then they have to swim for it in the arctic waters uh um jem hits her head i mean at this point and so she's like unconscious in the arctic waters and they show like you know it, it, it uh, quite a few hours have passed like that is not good for her brain no <laughs> there is something going to be let done. alone like the, the the temperature issues oh yeah and so they're stuck in the middle of nowhere the misfits go like oh look we can see them they're in trouble well if we save them that way we'll look good and they'll want to give us like the property i guess that's the least asshole plan they've ever come up with but it's still dumb yeah and they think that doing it themselves, like, they could easily just get just as much credit by saying, oh, they're there, let's call, I don't know, the Coast Guard, or someone that could actually do something about this. Instead, they decide, like, to try to board, like, a little rowboat. And one of them is just really British for no reason. They're like, you yanks, I don't understand! She sounds like Eliza Doolittle. <laughs> <laughs> just for no reason one of the misfits in this i think it's a new misfit they must have added because this is a later season one i don't know they get caught in the riptide and almost killed by icebergs again it's a chase scene with an iceberg um they're then saved by a seaplane the seals are the ones that then lead them to find gem like they they find like uh the daughter's uh like uh uh cap just floating in the water ominously, and they're like, let's follow the seals. <laughs> oh, God. So they the seals, you know, because I guess they are like dogs or dolphins or whatever, lead them to save everybody, and the sun's like, oh, you know what? These seals aren't bad after all. And the thing is, is, one of the sun's lines earlier is really funny, where it's like, what have the seals ever done for us? Oh, and don't forget, in the middle of this, the whole thing is is that um, Pizzazz is constantly getting called by her dad, saying, don't disappoint me again. And in the very end, uh, when the deal is like falls through and Pizzazz finally has a, a, a call to her dad to tell him, like, I'm sorry, this deal didn't go through, his, his final parting shot is, I thought you would finally make me proud of you. Wow, yeah. Holy is shit! No wonder she's fun. such a shithead. Holy crap. Yeah. Explains a lot. And so then, after all this, Pizzazz just leaves Eric Raymond in the wilderness to die. And I'm guessing this is just the end of the series because I'm not watching anymore. <laughs> just. Ugh. I <laughs> the thing is, is that this sounds so much more it interesting than it actually is. It sounds more interesting than it actually is. I have to, because I have to. My brain has to create something entertaining out of this in my head in because otherwise I am just upset over the time it took to to watch this boring it's piece so of shit. It's fucking dry. And That's there's the a big there's issue. a there's a fandom for this thing. There's they they recently did a comic series. Yeah. I think uh IDW if I recall correctly is is the one doing that. It's just Right. Cuz it's a it's a Hasbro property. That's it's yes. One, so, so it's just like do you think that someone could have taken this premise and done something good, or was it doomed from the start, do you think? I mean, you certainly could have done something with the the general concept of this. I mean, you yeah, know. throw throw out a couple things that weren't necessary, but, like, the general concept, you could have done something interesting, I think. I mean, there's been shows that have done really interesting stuff, even with, like, music battles that have been, you know, both fine and interesting. I mean, there there's a very good, uh, sh you know, Magical Girls series for children that, that's literally is composed of, like, ballet dancing uh, as, like, a form of, like, you know, challenge. Yeah. You know, that that works. You know, you, you can do a lot of sort of stuff with weird concepts. And, you know, the 80s hair metal, like, types, you know, or not even really, but, like... Well, again, so I, of, like, it's closer to Visual stuff. K to me. Sure. But more in the sense of, like, you could easily have done something very interesting with all the stuff here. It's just that they didn't... Well, Not, like, talking about music and trying to be a musician and, like, navigating that industry stuff, like, could have had some If you had more characters and, and here drama these, and drama. Yeah. It's, none of these people are really that characters. Like, that's the funny thing is that the misfits all have more character from the episodes we watched than, you know, the protagonists ever did. Yeah. That's kind of funny. I mean, yeah. they're assholes, but. That's something. Yeah. It's more than nothing. Well, hey, in this episode, we found out that Pizzazz has a really fucked up dad. <laughs> like, that's something, I guess. 
I mean, that's not necessarily characterization on her part because that's more like something that happens to her, but that's still something. Like, that's a relationship of some sort that is kind of explained and explored somewhere. Like, yeah. we don't see anything about how Jerrica relates to her dad at all. Like, nope. we see her kind of sad at the funeral, but that's it. Like, there's no, like, flashbacks or, or really, like, any rumination about, like, uh, about the legacy of the company that she has to uphold. Like, nothing. And, yep. and also, all that, the orphanage thing is just there to go, well, our, our character is basically Jesus. Like, she's the best ever, can't do anything wrong, we're just gonna have her also do orphans. Like, as if, like, the music industry stuff wasn't kind of, like, enough. Don't do orphans. Yeah. <laughs> don't do it. Teen orphans, don't do them. <laughs> it's just... Uh, I do not recommend this show at all, Um, even for ironic viewing. As we said, like, watch Speed Racer, and there's a lot of fun because of just how whacked out it is, and it and it's exciting enough to keep that going. Um, yeah, this, even, G. Like... I, even G.I. Joe, which is a bit closer to being like this, is much more interesting in its weirdness and its nonsense than this. But even ignoring, like, all the weirdness stuff, like, G.I. Joe, to me, when I've watched what little I have... I always get the impression for that, like, the action is still more interesting because it well, feels the, the like... Well, the pacing. The pacing is... The it, pacing it, is the pacing is better, but there also is some... Even for all the goofy, you know, like, nonsense that is G.I. Joe, it feels like there is some concept of stakes. The stakes here are all just, oh, the holograms are going to be maybe less rich. You're like, I want that gig. That's it. It's like, that's the main, like, that's the main conflict here is just, like, money. And it's just kind of like, oh, these, these, you know, rich assholes are all fighting to be slightly more richer than the others at this point. Like, yeah, one of the group cares about orphans more, but it's like, ooh, they could they could have sold their computer if that's all they were after, you know. Yep. Like, no, it's it's just a giant vanity uh, vanity competition between these two organizations. Well, it's like, it's like at this point, yeah. why bother having yeah. it be music at all? You yep. know, it's like, I'm going to get those, those gems and holograms. Tech rat, stop drinking your Nuka Cola and build that shriek ray. <laughs> I mean, it might as well be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nixie, I want to stop talking about gem. Uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty much done with that. So um, next time we are going to be talking about Freakazoid. So this will be something that is very much a, a palate cleanser. Um, sure, and we won't be talking about. Well, I mean, we'll probably talk about specific episodes, but we're but not giving we're, like any sort of assignment yeah, for this. Yeah, I'm not going to be detailing. I mean, the reason I detail the plots of these types of shows is because they're. It's almost funny in how nonsensical, like the the event to, to mention, event is. But by With going Freakazoid, by, it doesn't make any sense. It, it doesn't make sense. Not to, to do mention, that. we like to do that typically because talking about individual plots and individual like, sort of construction of episodes. Is often a very good broad indicator for how these episodic shows are composed as a whole. Yes, because a lot of these f are so formulaic. It's Mad any, Libs. All yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, that is a perfect way of looking at it. Is that these shows, like, they are so built on a rote formula that what we described here and what we criticize about their plots and whatnot can be transplanted to almost any episode in the show, regardless and of And other plot. shows. That's the worst part. Yeah, exactly. Ah, uh, so anyway, we're going to be talking about, about Freakazoid in general. Um, yep. And let's see, you can always reach us, of course, through email, adthepodcast at gmail.com. I do read them, um, and if you guys send me series, I do have a list that I, that I look at and that we select from. So feel free to send those in. You can also, of course, uh, write us on uh, iTunes, writing reviews. Uh, which is always a nice thing, helps promote things around. You can also uh, find this show in higher quality. I do a higher quality mix of things, in case you love the sound of our voices. Uh, you can hear to that on YouTube. Yep. So Zorak posts those there are. And uh, you can always reach us on Twitter. Uh, mine is at RYMagnuson. And I'm at S-A-Zorak. All right, we will see you guys next time. 